All right, hi everybody. Um, I am Alan McConkey. I'm the lead cartographer at Stamen Design. Um, there's our Mastodon links. It's the new Twitter. Um, I have a ton of links to other stuff. There's no way I can fit what I want to say in this talk. So there's a link to the deck down here. I also put it in the chat for this ch for this event, um, and I'll put it on all the slides. So don't feel like you have to take notes right now. But we got these little short links here. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Stamen base maps that I'm going to be talking about that we recreated on Stadium Maps, which was the title of the talk that I failed to mention. Um, I'll then, second part, we'll talk about that actual process of migrating really old maps onto a new platform. And then the end, I'll kind of go over the results. Stamen is a data viz and design studio. Uh, we make a lot of maps, but we also do some data viz that is not map related. We've been around for a long time. Um, from 2001, we work for all kinds of different clients, big tech companies, uh, NGOs, nonprofits, professors, uh, museums, all kinds of different people. Um, we've been around for a long time. The, the maps that I'm going to be talking about all happened before my time, actually. So it was like joining, taking over a map store. These base maps are, um, you, you've probably seen them in various places. They're called Toner, Terrain, and Watercolor. We created those with a grant from the Knight Foundation. It was originally funded to create tools for journalists. Um, and so we created this thing, and I keep saying we, but this all happened right before I joined. Um, this thing on the bottom left was a handy geocoder tool that journalists could use to, um, if a bunch of points for an article they needed to put on a map. This is stuff that was really not available, not easy to do back then. Um, but it turned out that people were more interested in, hey, you made a cool new base map, let's explore that some more. So the, the, the grant kind of pivoted into what can you do with creating open base maps from OpenStreetMap data. So they also created a, ter a terrain style. And then to really push the limits of what you can do with open data, the fact that you can get the raw data for OpenStreetMap was really kind of mind-blowing at the time. Um, they created this watercolor style. And this is just like, I, I, I think nothing I've done at Samen has ever lived up to this. It's just amazing the extent to which it is something you could never imagine have being possible from, and you couldn't certainly not do it with any proprietary data if you didn't have access to that. So uh, yeah, definitely. I've also got links to read more about the stuff on these slides. This is a blog post I wrote kind of digging into the history of OpenStreetMap um, and how OpenStreetMap and Stamen related for the years. But yeah, these became super popular, and we were giving them away from free. So a lot of times people just, if you're creating a website for the first time and you read a tutorial about, I need a, I need a tiled base map, you'd often pick one of ours. And in fact, the OpenStreetMap wiki for a long time said, go use the same in tiles. Don't use the, the ones from OpenStreetMaps too, because we were giving them away for free. Um, super popular. People love them. But over the years, um, it's not really our job. We're not really good at maintaining a service like this. Like We focus on what a cl client comes in. They have a need. We work really hard to deliver for the client. Um, and then we move on to the next project. We're not really designed to keep a platform going. Um, so over time, bits of this started to break. Uh, bits of the, the, the database you know, was getting old, too. Like We weren't updating the data. Um, so you, know, you get this experience like you see just a bunch of broken tiles, or people kept right, complaining that this thing I added to OpenStreetMap five years ago was not on the map. You know, Yeah, we haven't updated it more than that. Um, also, the costs were relatively high. I mean, we did, we, this is generating these rasters. Um, mostly it was AWS and Fastly costs. Uh, I mean, it's basically like we're a small studio. We're like 12 employees. This was like paying for a whole other employee just to give away a free service. Um, we just couldn't keep doing that after a while. And unsupported, yeah. We were focusing on client work. We didn't really have time to, to get around to everybody's bug, bug requests. This was not our job. So we were just sitting there, and this thing would catch on fire, and we'd just go back to work. So at some point, we're like, does this still spark joy? Do we just turn this off? I mean, it's, it's getting to be kind of gross, kind of be embarrassing. Do we really need to keep providing this for people? We had a great run. Um, but it really ties the room together. We just didn't want to let go of it. We love this thing, even though it was a headache all the time. Um, I mean, the real right thing to do would be to rebuild it, update it, keep it modern, figure out a way to somehow fund it. That's not really, again, what we were good at, but we decided, OK, we got to do it. We got to update these. So now we'll talk about how we w undertook 
getting these old raster styles into the vector world, into the, the modern era. Um, we met with these great guys at Stadium Apps. So Stadium Apps uh, is like a map box, you know, like an open map tiler. Like they provide the APIs for people to make maps. They are that's their job. That's what they're good at. Um, they are uh, they focus on like data privacy. They focus on um, affordable services. They're really into open source, giving back to open source. They're on the board of Map Libre. Like we love them. They have the same ethos that we have, but they're also realistic about you can't just kind of have open stuff that is free forever, always. Um, they're more realistic about these things. Uh, Luke from Stadia gave a much longer talk at Save the Map EU. Go watch that. He's got more content that I can simply not fit into this. Um, but yeah, Luke and Ian were great guys. So we figured we're going to work with you guys. We're going to rebuild this, and it's going to live on Stadia's um, ecosystem on a more modernized uh, platform. Yeah, if I didn't say already, these had a lot of traffic, and that chart down there is when we switched it over to, to Stadia, and like they, it was like doubling their traffic. Um, these three tile sets were actually, you know, more than three. There's actually a bunch of different variants that we supported. There's like a light, a light toner, a dark toner. You can get a raster version that's just transparent labels, just transparent lines, so you could like stack your data on top. This was really important back in the leaflet days to be able to put labels on top of your data viz layer. So we really needed to have like 10 different styles. Um, we we ne really never enabled HTTPS on these things. So like some of them were still like, you know, insecure endpoints. We were using the, the Fastly URLs. Um, and getting this stuff set up on a new platform, yeah, we had new data inputs. We used Natural Earth. Uh, we used Open Map Tile Schema. Um, we had to pull in the uh, land cover elevation data for the terrain in particular. Um, one special data set we had to make sure we get in, so I had to go dig up the old uh, Null Island GeoJSON from the old toner repo and make sure we got that into the workflow. Um, but from our point of view, from, and so definitely check out uh, Luke's talk about more of the, the back end issues. Um, from our point of view, from the same side, we were like, the design challenge was serious. Like, how do we make something that it looks like a drop in replacement, um, but is using a completely new stack, completely different data inputs? Um, using all of the vectors and to make it look like what we had done really lovingly in what is possible in the in the raster world. Um, the just the land cover data um, is always a headache to figure out how you're going to classify it correctly to get the right colors to make it look right in Australia, but also to make it look right in Nevada and all these different other places. Um, we ended up uh, getting something that we thought looked pretty good, but it's never going to look exactly the same as what the old raster was because of the vintage of that data and the way raster effects look. Um, in particular, we, you get around a lot of the pixelization of, of, ra of land cover data at certain zooms, but you want to be able to zoom in and out smoothly. So in the raster world, we can do all kinds of nice blur effects to kind of to kind of soften those edges. Um, we had to figure out completely different ways to use blur effects in um, in a vector map to make it not look like weird colored halos around each blob to make it kind of smooth and seamless, but it's still not quite the same, but we think it really looks pretty good. So the one in the middle is what we ended up with, and the one at the right is the original raster style. For toner as well, um, it, it is a little bit easier to make a vectorized version of toner. It's a very hard black and white, um, uh, very crisp looking map. It looks great actually in vectors, although dealing with like the weird half tone patterns are a little bit iffy. Um, and of course, the, the the typography is very prominent on something like Toner. Um, Stamen famously, our, our founder, like is just loves Helvetica to the point that it's kind of like a joke, and then it becomes serious again. Um, we found out the old map wasn't actually using Helvetica to our shock. Um, it was actually using Arial all this time. Um, so we're like, okay, good, we can finally make it Helvetica. But then like, it's Helvetica is not an open source font anyway. Um, why are we doing all this open data stuff and using an, a, a non-open source font? We ended up using Inter, and I'll, you can try to guess which of those was Inter and which is Helvetica, and um, I have no prizes. <laughs> we also uh, use this as a chance to keep working on a lot of the tools that we've been developing for some of our base map work for other big clients. Um, we do this all the time. We have all of these tools that we just we need to uh, help us compare things side by side to, to when we make a change to any style sheet, we want to see, did it do what we want? Did we have any regressions? So we developed Mapature, which, which so few people have mentioned in their talks. Um, 
we have a tool called Chartographer, which kind of like explodes a style sheet and shows you in a bar graph style, like what are your zoom ranges of each, of each element. Um, so many of these tools that we just are continuing to work on to make it easy for us to develop these 10 different styles and have them all kind of relate to each other and not have to redo everything. Um, a lot of these are open source, some of them are not yet. Yeah, so the results, we think it came out pretty well. Um, and also just vector tiles in general have a lot of benefits that we were really keen to promote and, and so was Stadia. Um, they are a lot smaller to serve, so your costs are gonna be a lot less if you can get people to migrate onto vector maps. And you get benefits like um, you can tilt and, and, and twist the map around and your labels still look upright. That's kind of a cool thing. Um, one of the very first users we saw who jumped on the, on the new vectorized version um, created a language picker tool, which we had not built into support. Basically, just as a search and replacing, grabs out the, the name field from this vector style sheet. And we always prefer uh, preferred English labels. And this has a little language picker. I can, and so right now, this map you can't really tell is using German labels. Um, that's all was just already in the open map tile schema. Um, something you could just simply couldn't do in the raster world. You'd have to like re-render an entire whole global set of tiles if you wanted German map tiles. Uh, but we also had to tell people the old stuff was going away. So we had to figure out how to gracefully migrate everybody over to the new platform. And this is a service that had been out for 10 or more years. People have built websites on this. They thought, hey, this is a free um, tile set. I'm never gonna have to worry about it. Well, how do we find those people and let them know, you're gonna have to migrate. You probably haven't touched your code in 10 years, just like we haven't. Um, how do we let you know? So we gradually started introducing these, these brownouts to like, give people a message like, you better, you need to fix this. But we, we also could track all the users and we could find out who the most popular users were. We could reach out to them before having to actually flip the switch. Um, yeah, so more before and afters. It looks different, but we still think it looks great. Um, a lot of just new data is amazing and we got to, to fix a lot of the things that have been nagging us like, um, you know, just little subtle styling things that we never got around to, to, to changing because they were hard to change and now they're a lot easier to fix. Um, and in many cases, ideally, if we did our job well, it should look pretty much the same. The, the one on the right is like, at, at these zoom levels, very little difference. And this is that toner light style, which actually turned out to be even more popular than the, than the really high contrast um, regular toner style. So, if you are already a user of our map tiles, last year you probably already migrated or else you would be having broken tiles on your map right now. So you probably already have moved, made the move. But there may be lots of you who at some point in the past, like same as tiles were too old, you moved to something else, yeah, you come back now. Um, check it out. Um, you can get the rasterized versions of all these style sheets and plug them into Leaflet so you don't have to change your code. But it is cheaper if you want to um, switch to the vectorized ones, use them in Map Libre. Um, you have to get an API key through Stadia Maps, but they're really on board with us that the idea is we want to make this as accessible as possible for people who really are using this to learn, using it for nonprofit purposes. So um, they have a really generous tier if it's non-commercial use. So we hope that a lot of those people who are just using this to learn, to like get into the community, do a little you know public service for their neighborhood or whatever, like we want people to be able to keep using those. Um, but yeah, if you're going to be one of these big users who was really charging us, you know, a lot of a lot of fastly bills, you could pay a little bit. Um, it's really affordable, so you can go there and uh, check it out at Stadium Maps. Start the migration. So you may notice that I didn't mention anything about watercolor. Um, watercolor is a uh, really special. Um, it, it it actually the code was even older because we in the past we had updated, still a long time ago, toner and in terrain, so those were at least on Cardo CSS, whereas um, watercolor was even before the invention of Cardo CSS. Um, and it's super customized MapNet code. You have to, it does all these like image processing things like add a blur, uh, edge detect, add some more noise, edge detect again, like, you know, you have to do all these little things to make it look handmade. All of that depends on raster operations and someday maybe we'll figure out how to do a vectorized version of that, but we just figured that would be way out of scope. That would be a huge amount of effort. Um, if you have ideas, let us know. Um, but yeah, this like a, this blog post from from 2012 just blows my mind on like how how you make that watercolor style. And there's also another source, so you can get those the snapshot of the archived watercolor 
you can't render any new watercolor tiles. Again, I encourage you to tr don't try. Um, but the s watercolor tiles and the code has actually been uh, added to the Smithsonian's collection, and you can hit their tile endpoint if you want to. So you can access watercolor through Stadia or through the Smithsonian. Um, so watercolor is kind of a special, separate way. It's still, but it's maintained for the future in its own way, which we're really happy about. Yeah, so we're, um, now we have this ground, this base to, to further iterate on. Maybe we'll make some more redesigns. Maybe we'll be able to make variations of this for future clients. Um, we're gonna keep working on those tools. There's a lot of little things we would like to be able to do if we were to modify the data schema and use more than just like the out of the box open map tiles. And yeah, as I mentioned, someday, maybe, maybe we'll figure out a way to recreate watercolor. Um, but yeah, let us know what you would like to see and uh, get in touch with us at these links. Thank you. <laughs>